Uh, James, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I do want to uh, dive into some of the fitness industry uh, in the second half of the podcast, but I want to start off with you and your story um, because that's one of the things that I took from the book the most. Um, First, I want to touch on on the concept of the rat race and and when did you realize that you'd become a part of it and when did you realize that you couldn't simply be a part of it anymore? Um, at the at the time that I was working in the corporate world, I never had like an epiphany. Uh, I think that there was just two main occasions where I was just sick of it. And I mean, I put on a suit for work and I never hated it at the time, but I never enjoyed it. I thought it was kind of just something you had to do. So I put it on happily. I'd go to work, I'd get the pay slips. And I used to always look at my friends that were personal trainers. I was so jealous of their job. I was like, oh, going to work in shorts, that'd be sick. Um, And then kind of both my uh, professional roles like internally combusted. Uh, The first of which where I was like, oh, I'm going to go to New Zealand and play rugby. I just came home one day, just just said to my parents, I was like, I'm off. Then the second time, I was seeing a girl and she wanted to go to Southeast Asia. And she said to me, why don't you come with me? And that's how little I really liked my professional life. I was like, okay. She was like, what? I was like, yeah, fine. I was like, I don't don't really want to do this. It was only when I was in Asia that I kind of looked around and I was like, I could have, I could do this every summer. I could work for six months and come over here for six months. Or, you know, I was thinking to myself, I'm just as happy here as I am, even when I get my biggest commission pay slip. So it kind of realigned my values a bit. Uh, six months of drinking beer every day. The, there was a life out there that wasn't quite that fit in the norm. I mean, my parents never went traveling and my dad was a corporate. So I think that that probably rubbed off onto me as, as the thing you do. And then after realizing that there was a world that probably my parents hadn't seen, it kind of opened my mind to it that way. What was it about that rat race that um, just didn't align with you? What was it? Was it the lack of freedom? Was it the lack of creativity? It's all bullshit. It is all bullshit. So for a start, uh, micromanagement, call stats. Now, keeping people accountable in the sales role to call stats is just a micromanagement. And if we look, you give... You, give, you should give a salesperson the rope. They can either climb it or hang themselves with it. And due to managers having to report to their managers, to report to directors, there are all these kind of little fine things put in. And I felt very suffocated by, you know, the fact if I'm two minutes late for work, although I'd spent the previous day's lunchtime in working, they're like, oh, James, you're a couple of minutes late to work. Oh, we need you to hit more calls. And I'd be like, I'm hitting my target. It would be frustrating. And I was like, I look around sometimes. And I was like, what, what's going on here? How, you know, even just sat at my desk, I was thinking, we're all just looking busy to fill this amount of time. And it was only, I, I became a personal trainer at 24 and I didn't read the four hour work week until about three, four years later. And then it kind of put all of my uh, notions of that, my preconceived notions together. So uh, Tim Ferriss's book, yeah, four hour work week. Suddenly I was like, I'm not alone. This is, this is shared with someone else. And that was the real confirmation I needed to just up and go. Mm. And you, you mentioned in the book as well, that one of the, one of the things about being in, in a role like that is even pretending to be busy is just, is, is exhausting. It's, it's so exhausting. And I mean, now I'm self-employed and operate my own business. I would never dream about drinking on a school night. It affects my productivity, my ability to function, all of this. When I worked in the corporate world, I got fucking smashed on nights out. I remember like some days I go to like a student union when I'm trying to float a professional job because whether I was in a good bit of health or on the brink of death with a hangover, I still got my work done and it was just staring at a screen pretending to look busy. And the giveaway would be on Friday afternoons. I had a director that used to sit behind me. He was in a corner office and he would leave quite early and I'd put on uh, fail compilations on YouTube people falling over stacking it on bikes and i'd be sat there at my desk like trying not to let out those laughs you know and you're like <laughs> and people are like what's wrong with james and i'll be there just pissing myself watching videos but yeah over in one of my uh one of my tips for anyone listening if you've got to get a certain amount of call stats i used to call up cornwall county council because where they had their menu of what the different divisions did it was on loop so it was press one press two press three to hear these options again stay on the line and it would go back around so i would do 30 or 40 calls and then i'd leave cornwall county council on loop for about an hour 
so that if anyone was to look at my call stats, my average call time was like three, four minutes. And they're like, James, this is excellent, mate. This is really good effort. Um, and uh, I think I'm, I won like an iPad at work at one time because my call averages were so good. But it was all, it was all fake. In the, in the midst of, of working that job, did you know what would make you happy? Did you know what line of work would, would be for you? Or? In the early years, it was very much surrounding uh, money. Uh, first of all, how much you're earning, but the position you're in. So I was like a sales executive. Then I was like, oh, the, up from an executive might be like a manager. It's suppose you get caught up in these internal hierarchies. Similar to any any line of work in a jiu-jitsu gym, the blue belts look up to the purple belts. We're looking up to the brown belts. Uh, in the work, in the work, everyone's like, "Oh, how can we get out of this cubicle into a corner office?" And I suppose I was so caught up in that that I wasn't. I never really questioned whether or not what I was doing was making me ha- happy. And I very much lived for the weekend with playing rugby on a Saturday. And it actually pains me now to see my friends that are still there. And I could see that my weekends were so important to me i thought that life was all about just deriving your pleasure from the weekends and doing monday to friday to earn money and no one ever knocked me out of that way of thinking uh, I, I didn't read at this time none of my friends were really reading um it you you almost become siloed into your professional life where you wake up have coffee go to work you're bored you earn money you go home and then you, you kind of like uh, get in front of Netflix so you can fill yourself with a bit of entertainment before you hit repeat on the same day over again. Yeah, and I mean, I guess one of the important things about loving what you do um, Monday to Friday is if you don't, you're falling into that five for two trade in which you're giving yeah. five days of your life essentially for two back. Yeah, 100%. Uh, again, where... <laughs> There, there was a few clients that I've had as personal trainers, one of which who uh, was a very wealthy man, but he never seemed too happy about it. And I'll never forget, he was always telling me, James, buy houses, bricks and mortar, are going to go up in price. You know, look at my new car, look at my watch. I remember once he was wearing a Breitling to a PT session. I was like, why are you wearing a watch? Oh, I forgot to take it off. Yeah, he didn't forget to take it off. He wanted me to notice. And um, he was telling me about one of his mates who lived in like Woking, uh, uh, or no, Dorking, somewhere really random. And he was like, he lives in a shitty little house with his dog. And he goes, but he's fucking happy. And he goes, I can't understand it. And he would get annoyed about it. He was like, I can't understand why this guy's so happy. And he kind of took a minute back and he was like, I suppose I'm kind of jealous of this guy. And it only occurred to me probably then that there are some people that have accomplished a lot in life who aren't actually that happy. And sometimes you see a postman who is the happiest person ever. He's not got a report to anyone. He's got his jobs. He's got his routine. He's got his radio. And suddenly, I suppose, in my mid to late 20s, I got knocked out of alignment that it shouldn't be about trading as many hours as you can for the biggest pay slip. I mean, for some people, if that makes them happy, fair enough. But you're, you're giving up so much freedoms. And even now, the concept of working nine hours to five, I think is largely un- unproductive if you said to people look you have to do a minimum of three hours a day and we'll give you a lot of jobs to do people would be so much more productive with it and happier no i agree and um, where do you find now you're you have a bit more control where do you find that balance between you know living a life you're happy with and maintaining that sort of money motivation because i know some people say they're not money motivated, but I think everyone's a little money motivated, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, yeah, 100%. I mean, and it's it's almost the reaffirmation that you have with that you spend your money on. So for me, um, when I fly business class, I take a moment every time. I was I didn't fly business class 27. I'm now 30. So for 90% of my life, I didn't even know what it looked like. I didn't even know what it came with. And the first time I flew business, I, I asked them when we could eat. And they were like, well, mate, you can eat whatever you want. And I was like, this is amazing. And there are times that you go through long days at work or where I'm tired or where I'm client facing a lot. And you take it on the chin because you love your work. But then you recharge that with what money can buy you. And then when you're on a plane or when you fly your friend's business, they're the times that almost like charge this intrinsic battery for your work hustle. And it's not that you directly take the pleasure from the money, but what the money brings and you know, I would still be happy if I was sitting in the economy with my friends, but it's almost like that accelerator when you get it. And so 
I'm driven more by gratification. And I think that's why social media was such a good uh, platform to me because I gouged I kind of determine how well I've hit a, a topic for a discussion or got my points across based on useless instant gratifications of likes and uh, engagements and share or whatever. But that's what motivates me. Uh, and the same that, you know, when I play Call of Duty, I want to get the most XP from a game. You know, when I'm on that, if someone uh, interferes with that, I get annoyed. And with money, although it's not like a singular thing, it's, it's, it's a gratification as well. And when you get paid well for your efforts, it's almost exactly the same to me as, you know, likes would be on Facebook or how XP would be on Call of Duty. It's almost like um, a novelty uh, gratification that makes you feel good for putting your effort in. Mm. One of the, the things on this subject that um, stuck out to me in the book, I'll read it now. I said, you said, any success credited to me in my professional life can only come off the back of having eventually aligned my passion with my daily life and career, and most of all, being happy with what I choose to do every day. And that makes me wonder because, you know, some people might have a passion for something, but may not essentially be, you know, very skilled in that area. So my question is, is it simply a case of following our passion or is it more of a Venn diagram approach of what makes us happy and what we're actually good at? Yeah, I think that um, there is that element of what needed to be good at something. Now, I think a lot of the times, not all the times, people become very good at what they repeatedly do. Mm. Um, so in the sense that for me, getting going live on Instagram, writing email marketing uh, campaigns and all these things, I wasn't good at them originally. And I wasn't passionate about them before, but in the pursuit of, of bettering myself at them, I've now become passionate about it. and. Do you know what? There, there are some things I will concede on that. With that, with a lot of the messaging I have on social media, I'm aiming to hit eighty percent of people, and eighty percent of people are going to sit back and be like, 50 50 on the edge. They're going to go with the side of the fence that has their passion. I think there are going to be twenty percent of people that don't fit into that category. They skip to the next chapter, and I've always been like that because I find that some people have niche professions where they can create a lot of freedom or they get uh they might earn good money for a skill that isn't such a passion but then allows them to spend time to pursue a hobby so uh for instance i know a lot of uh jujitsu coaches and they're working within their passion but i don't actually think it's just that that they love it's the fact that they have six seven hours a day to do whatever they want on the side so i think there are some gray areas to that but yeah as a rule i think that people that are in a 50 50 position someone who's 26 in a corporate world and thinking i want to be a pt should absolutely go be a pt because those areas that feel like work probably won't feel like work after a while when was it when you made that switch your career and and, and how did that decision come about and, and was there was there an easy one to to jump into your industry that you're in now uh so when i was 24 uh, I decided to be a personal trainer and my sister texted me actually. She said, why don't you become a PT? I came back from Asia. I was fat and very deconditioned. I didn't train for six months and I was boozed nearly every day for six months. And it was great. But after a while, my self-esteem was taking a hit. I was like, what am I doing? Uh, came back and I was on like a fitness straight off the plane, went for a run, started like, mom, stop giving me food. I need to get fit. And then a few of my friends at the same time were like, oh, can you give us any hints? As I was losing a bit of weight, I was like, yeah, you need to do this, you need to do that. And that's where it kind of spurred for my sister to say become PT. And I thought about it and it's a very saturated market and online PT wasn't a thing when I started. And a lot of my friends said to me, they were like, don't do it. They go, everyone's a PT and there's absolutely no money in it. So my friends actually in a protective way were like telling me not to do it. And I was like, do you know what? I don't know what I want to do. I don't want to go back to an office. I'm just going to give it a go. And um, I was very fortunate to take a risk going into a gym paying rent. And funnily enough, there were a few other personal trainers in there. And on my first day, I went up to the reception of the gym. I said, can I email your database? And this was purely because I knew how to write an email from working in sales and recruitment. They said, yeah, sure. So rather than sending an email from the gym, before GDPR, they gave me two and a half thousand email addresses. So 
because that, that was fine. They had opted for marketing. The manager was like, yeah, I suppose that's marketing. But back now, he'd probably have a heart attack. I won't mention any names. And um, so I went into my Google, my Gmail account. I had blind carbon copied everyone because I knew what a VCC was. Most personal trainers that go into the industry have gone from working in Sports Direct to fucking getting their PT qualification. So sometimes even structuring an email is pretty bad. And um, I said, hi, my name's James. I'm a new personal trainer. If I can uh, answer any questions for you, here's my email address. And before you know it, I was doing 30 hours of PT within my second week of being a PT. I was very rarely walking the floor and I managed to do a lot of hours very quickly, which meant that by the time I was about three or four years into being, or three years into being a PT, I'd done a huge amount of hours for my amount of time in the industry. And because of that, when someone came in, you become like Sherlock Holmes as a personal trainer what people wear, how they move, how they squat. Like someone comes in, you're like, Metcons, but he's not a CrossFit. Uh, look at his squat. Like whatever it is, there's always this way that you judge people. Uh, not in a bad way. And um, I was like, I'm not challenged where I'm at. And I was like, I'm going to go to Australia uh, because I saw that as the fitness capital of the world, even though I'd never been. And I was like, worst case scenario, I'd go there for a few months. It would be an, almost another internal combustion. I would have had the New Zealand playing rugby. You go into Asia to get fat and then going to Australia to try and make it as a PT. And uh, things just accelerated uh, really when I got here. And something I've never spoken about before. Have you heard of a book called Outliers? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah. yeah. Where he says pr pretty much that people are very lucky with literally everything. And after reading that book, I looked back and I was like, how fucking fortunate was I? to have three years of PT experience, which is enough to probably go online, but not too much that I would have made a serious decision like opening a gym. Mm. It was on the cusp of Facebook and Instagram, both being dominant brand-based platforms at the same time. I went to a country that had a shared time zone to my two largest kind of followings, the UK and Australia. I was at 27 years old, which is old enough to have like a bit of gravitas, but young enough to still have a brand that didn't seem it was like too past it. I actually feel that I was very lucky getting or going to Australia at that time, doing the lives in those time zones, in that part of my career, in an aspirational phase and not having enough savings, not having a mortgage at home that was it making me money that kind of channeled me down this path of being so consistent with what content I put out every day. And then what, three years later, I'm, I'm now here. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting to me, oh, oh, you know, you've jumped into that industry, um, after, after switching from another and you've managed to be, to be so successful and in a short period of time. And it, it makes me wonder, you know, what are the contributing factors to that? And one of the things you talk a lot about in your book is the, the power of habit. And I maybe hundred percent of the people, the successful people we interview on here talk about habits why are they so important to you personally and uh, how have you used them to your advantage? Uh, I would say compounding interest. So uh, the, I use the email marketing one in the book where, uh, you know, I'm writing those first few emails. It took me 10 months to make money on an email. And it was just a habit that I had to do. And now I get to the point where I can't relax until I've done those things. And um, for me, I, I wake up very stressed. UK are awake, especially now the clocks have changed. When I wake up at six, it's 9 p.m. So between six and seven, I've got this fucking power hour of catching up. I had like 98 WhatsApp messages this morning from group chats. <laughs> I'm like, oh fuck, am I getting sued? Has anyone died? Um, and then after that, I've got my like job bits to do. And I really enjoy getting those done so I can then relax. But those, those habits, they, they pay dividends over time. Doing the live videos. When I meet people in real life, the biggest, kind of my academy members the uh, almost like the titans among the group the people i meet in real life the people that have the drastic transformations the people that stop me in the street they always say to me they're like i started watching your lives no one's ever like oh mate you had this fucking cracker of a post where you're ripping some bitch about boom but that was never it it was always the lives and then um people are like oh you know your emails you know you wound me down over the emails and although i think it's very easy for people to get caught up in you know how charismatic they are but ultimately the things that i remain doing the emails the live videos the posting um and the podcasts to a certain extent are actually really the the main foundations of my business and my brand 
so um yeah it's it's very difficult i currently in any sexual relationships i refuse to let women stay around because of how stressed i am in the morning on a weekend sure if i get shit based that's fine but any other night i'm like i can't do this i was like, i'm a horrible human being to be around in the morning I, even making my bed when i wake up if there's someone there i'm like get out of the bed get out of the bed i need to make that i'm not going for a shower until i made the bed so you need to get out of it then i go for a shower and <laughs> when i'm going to shower i'm like I'm like, you're, you're ruining my routine, my rhythm. It stresses me out. And I'm going to have a real issue when I get into a serious relationship uh, in the coming years with that kind of thing. I'm going to be, I, I said on live the other day, I was like, I might have my own bedroom so I can just get up and do my habits and uh, get the things done that I need to in the early part of the day. Yeah, I think that's a, a good example of um, focusing on the habit because I think you, you give the James Clear um, ice cube metaphor in, in the book about, yeah. you know, there's... There's a difference between, you know, start, starting out a habit and it becoming a, a real habit. It starts ticking over, it starts taking on its own, you know, its own life. What, what are the ways in which you assure a habit sticks rather than just, you know, the initial novelty of a habit? You know, some people pick up a habit, they, they say, I'm going to read, I'm, I'm going to build reading as a habit. And, and, and a week later, and it's starting to dip. How do you avoid falling into that trap? It's a tough one, really. And sometimes I look back and I don't know how I've done it because mm. I started yoga two weeks ago. I got rid of my mat one week after. I was like, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to do this every day. I feel great. My hamstrings, I can touch my toes. A week later, I was like, nah. But with that, even it's an internalized conversation because in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it was because you weren't getting gratification. I said, well, James, you weren't getting them for the emails either. Um, so... It's a tough one. I suppose people have to have a clear vision of what they want to, what they want to get, and whether or not that habit's going to pay into it long term. Mm. So for me, I like to be fit, stay healthy. Is yoga going to contribute to that? Yeah. Is it going to be the be all and end all? Not really. I suppose for me, it was having set in stone in my mind what was the uh, what was going to happen if I kept those habits up. I had to visualize it. I had to believe it. And for me. There was probably an inkling of me that thought, James, do this for a few years and you can get by with one video and one email a day. And there are some days that I do that now. So I suppose I kind of manifested that, that situation to occur. I don't expect that if I was to do yoga every day that I'd be a yogi in a few years to come. So it's a tough one. I'm, I'm not entirely sure myself, but I suppose visualizing the potential uh, dividends that you could get from that habit have been largely influential. And what are some of the most effective habits you've developed personally in the last few years then? The making the bed was a big one. Uh, the, one of my first housemates I lived with in Australia was uh, OCD cl like cleanliness. And the boys I lived with, no matter what, I saw them get in some states pissed. And I'd wake up, I'd stick my head in, bed's made perfect. And it kind of, you know, something like that where you start your day you're like, this is how I'm going to start it. Because I d ultimately, I saw a really good video with a, some captain or major where he was like, look, if there are 10 things you're going to do today, make your bed should be the first one. And if you don't make your bed, you can't get a clean streak. You can't get your 10 out of 10 for the day. And there are times, even today, uh, my laundry, I do all my laundry myself. And I went to shower and I knew my laundry was in the washing machine. And then I was like, I walked past it again. And I was like, James, if you don't get your laundry out and hang it up now, how the fuck are you going to send a good marketing email? How are you going to inspire people to join your product? How are you going to do this if you can't even get your laundry bin out of the laundry bin? Because it'd be in the back of my head the whole time. I'd be sat here trying to convince people to use my services while I've got laundry in the laundry bin getting creased. Um, so I suppose it's like personal admin. Some nights where I'm in bed and it's 9.30 and I'm falling asleep and I don't brush my teeth. It's the little things like going to brush your teeth at that time which makes the difference. And I think that if you win those little battles, the bigger battles come naturally. Um, so I wouldn't say to people uh, to set, you know, massive habits, but do the little things and work up. And uh, yeah, I always kind of sit in bed at night knowing that I've done all the things I needed to. And um, again, like when people set weight loss goals, they're like, oh, I've got 10 kilograms to lose. I'm like, you don't, you have one kilogram. That's where your sight should be focused. Um, and I think that we need to look at our, our kind of objectives for the day in a similar fashion. And if you complete all the mini little things you had to do today, then that's going to prove to be very effective come tomorrow. 
on the uh, on the subject of bed i mean you you talk about the importance of sleep in in the book and um i read a book uh a year or so ago by matthew walker called why we sleep and yeah. in the book he says that sleep is the best performance performance enhancing drug there is yet we we seem to ignore it um and you know a lot of the health professionals we've had on you preach about sleep and how that we we underestimate it and so my question to you is how many how many hours of sleep a night do you get and how do you manage your sleep to the point where you, you, you're looking at the quality because i know some people they, they delve into it they look at the, the circadian rhythms etc what's your process when it comes to sleep so again about a year and a half ago when that matthew walker book came out it i never thought about sleep in such an important context and it wasn't something I neglected, but I wasn't as aware of it. And I tell you what, so I've not worn a watch in years, but now I'm wearing a Garmin. And the primary purpose is to track my sleep and my activity. And it's been a game changer because I now go to bed so that my gratification tomorrow will be better. So I can quantify uh, the quality of my sleep. Uh, even Saturday night, someone's like, do you have a glass of wine? And I was worried about how it would affect my sleep score. Because when I drink wine, I typically get less uh, rapid eye movement sleep. So uh, it's one of those things, but it's been a little journey for me where I've started respecting my sleep more and developing a bit of a sleep stress. I feel amazing. I average about eight and a half to nine hours a night. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and it's, it's one of those things that really gets on top of me if I don't sleep well. And it's in my head the next day, which is sometimes, sometimes having a watch that tells you everything and gets you stressing about stressing about stuff um but no sleep is a fundamentally big one for me i'm a big napper in the afternoon uh i do a five minute test where i lay in a comfortable position for five minutes listening to a joe rogan podcast and if i fall asleep i fall asleep and if not uh i don't and i'm very fortunate at the moment to wake up without an alarm around 6 a.m most mornings um but yeah it's it's one of those things where if i'm honest with you if i can't sleep i can't do anything so i was on tour recently uh, promoting the book my sleep was fucked I was drinking every night and if I'm drinking I'm not sleeping well if I'm not sleeping well I'm, and I'm uh, drinking there's no point in me even trying to adhere to a diet so I got a bit fat during the tour um, it's the very first boundary that I need to lock in place uh, I have a I'm it's, you know what I'm becoming more of a diva as I get older as well I need a good fan I need an air con if I'm in Australia uh, I need a good pillow set up and um, uh, <laughs> Luke, who organized this call for us tonight, uh, when we were traveling in Australia, we had a, a, a group that were organizing the tour. And uh, he was like, it's very important that James has two pillows. Like if James, it, and this is my diva thing, not like I needed anything random, but there must be enough pillows to me. And I ended up actually doing the whole tour taking a pregnancy pillow with me. So that's how much I like to, to sleep. And if you haven't got a pregnancy pillow, I can't believe Matthew Walker didn't put that in the book. It's life changing. You're the second person to, to to recommend a pregnancy pillow on this podcast, actually. And um, it, it's incredible. It's honestly incredible because I'm a side sleeper and I need something between my knees. Yeah. And there's just a whole new level of comfort. And I could never sleep on the floor. But I was hungover on a bus uh, a couple of months ago and I slept for 40 minutes. I felt like I'd been asleep all night. So uh, Amazon for anyone that's thinking of getting one. Do you see benefits from a professional perspective and uh, a fitness and performance um, perspective because I can't remember if it was Impact Theory or, or Tim Ferriss I was listening to but they were interviewing LeBron James's his coach and LeBron and LeBron says that after practice every day he goes home and he naps for an hour religiously and he, he attributes sleep to a lot of his performance. So I I, I never usually would train twice in a day unless I could sleep, which is kind of a bit of an oxymoron because when I wake up from a nap, I feel even more tired. Mm. But I, I used to have this thing, and sometimes if I, if I managed to have a little sleep, I would. And I trained with this black belt in Bali. Uh, he was a leg locker and beat the crap out of me so bad. That after a session, I went up to him and I was like, can I train with you? And he said, yeah. And when I walked in, we're rolling a bit. He says to me, um, do you nap? And I said to him, yeah, I tried to. He goes, good, because if you train twice in a day, you must nap. He says, that's my, my best bit of advice. He goes, you must. And then he turns to me, he goes, if you can't sleep, lay in a dark room for half an hour. He's like, you need it. And he, I'm pretty sure he like grabbed his nuts. He was like, you need it for your testosterone. You need it for your testosterone. But um, 
yeah, having a nap for me is amazing. I had a, a really good run today. Um, every time I get that inkling of, of being tired, I, I shoot off uh, and yeah, just try and do it. And if I can't sleep through it, although I'm a bit frustrated, it's fine. I think that's healthy. If I wait, if I work now later in the evening, I mean, uh, it's half past seven in the evening. I'm happy doing this, especially so because I've done the nap. I feel like I bought myself more time. And on the watch, it will show you your heart rate variability. And uh, yeah, you obviously recover a bit whilst having a nap. Yeah, man. Um, you can tell the th- passion coming from me from the nap. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And uh, one, of, one of the things um, I think about when I, when I think of your success and you as an individual, um, you know, I, when I, whenever I've seen you on, on TV, like on, on Good Morning Britain, for example, I think you're, you're a polarizing figure and you're not going to please everyone who's listening. But you talk about the importance of that in the book. You give the, the, the Formula One example. And I think of other influencers who, who do the same thing. Guys like John Burke, for example, who, who you know, annoy a lot of people and, and, and in the same breath gain a lot of fans through, through being that outspoken. Do you think there's, there's a need to essentially piss a few people off in order to gain truly like-minded people? Yes. Because I believe the majority of the crowd are so focused in having everyone love them. We've never lived in a world like now where we have social media. And in essence, we've created this massive popularity contest. And I can't help but feel that with nine people going all in the same direction, it's hugely beneficial to be the one that doesn't. And um, uh, there was a a guy that messaged me last night. He was really drunk. I could tell he was drunk because he texted me, said, I'm in London. And it was 5 a.m. in London this time. And he goes, I just told my friend to follow you. And he said, he doesn't like you. He thinks you're uh, arrogant. You love yourself. And I said, oh, okay, mate. Well, if you could find me the, the last post that stipulates that, I, w- I would love the feedback. And then he's like, well, I can't find the post because I, I don't think you're like that. But my friend, I just tried to get him to follow you. And he thinks that. And I said to him, I was like, mate, I, I can't please all your friends. I can't be put in front of every single one of your friends and expect them to love me for what I do. That's naive. That's stupid. I said, you're messaging me drunk at five in the morning because it's affected you that much that your friend doesn't like me. I was like, that's fine. That's okay. And even, you know, as a, as a percentage of how many people you actually need to buy into what you do, it's, it's not that important. And I love getting reactions out of people. I love pushing the line a little bit. And I think the people that have followed me for a long time see when I'm even doing it on purpose. But yeah, I feel, I feel we're so suckered into expecting everyone to love us. And ultimately, if that's your goal, you're going to fail. But if my goal is to piss off a lot of people and end up with a small pile of people that do like me, I can achieve my goal every day. So uh, it's, I suppose it's being realistic. One of the um, mentalities you, you talk about is the, the getting shit done mentality. And you stress the importance of aggression, but a good type of aggression. Why is, is that aggression so important? And how do we manage it so it, it's the right type and it's not having a negative effect on, on us rather than a positive? So having good aggression means that, like, uh, to me, it means we have to go after stuff. And we sometimes people are going to say no, and you've got to push through it. Again, if you need to book in a meeting with someone or um you know say you're trying to get something whether it's improving in your sport uh improve let's say you want to get fit and you want to run a good 10k time you've got to be aggressive against your own state of mind so when you're running your body's like i'm tired my chest hurts and you know this this little thing we have we're all we're all fucking soft when you get a bit of chest pain when you're running you're like am i having a heart attack you're like, no, it's just a bit of fucking chest pain. Get the fuck on with it. And you start to see your pace slowing down and like, or you get a little cramp in your stomach. You're like, oh my God, I might be dying. No, you're not dying. And you've got, you can't be nice to yourself the same way that you don't say, oh, come on, James, it's uh, time to get out of bed. You're like, get the fuck out of bed. Or when you go to have a swim in the ocean, you get, oh, it's actually a bit cold. It's not like, oh, I'm sure it'd be refreshing. You're like, get in the fucking water. <laughs> so for me, it's an internal dialogue that I have to have with myself. And um from combat sports to uh talks or whatever it is i have to hype myself up to have that aggression to stand my ground in debates and arguments um and even sometimes just to to bring it to social media videos where uh i do my lives at 7 a.m in the morning i've had about two coffees and i have to be aggressive at my point 
no, that's not how I feel on this. It's not how I feel on that. Otherwise, you know, you can end up being a bit vanilla. And uh, I think we like, I, and you know, I, I also think we suppress a lot of aggression through society where someone cuts you up in traffic, people are a bit soft about it. You know, uh, people don't even hold eye contact anymore. Where, you know, if someone, if you're, if you're looking at someone, oh, you want to go somewhere, oh, everyone's looking at the floor, everyone's worried about offending people. I think aggression is a, a missing ingredient to, to the good life, if I'm honest. Yeah. You should be getting angry. I think um, two guys that come to mind who I think back that point are, are Joe Rogan, when he talks about, you know, conquering your inner bitch. And um, yeah, yeah. David Goggins, when he talks about his, uh, his 40% done rule. You know, you, you say, for example, you're running, you think you're done, you finish, you're actually about 40% done. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you agree that we kid ourselves about our actual potential? Joe, I'm funny enough, I just downloaded Goggins' book today. I haven't started it, but I need to. Uh, but yeah, as far as the potential, 100%. Um, we seem to think that our mindset or our capability for learning uh, and our capability for developing is finite. We seem to think we're like a, a size of an engine or a caliber on a rifle. We seem to think it's set and that you can't just put a bigger bullet in the same rifle when really the elasticity of what we're capable of is huge. And, uh, you know, in three years, I've gone from walking the floor to taking talks and fucking selling out events, which to me is still mental. And everyone says, what's it like? And my answer is it's weird. That's the only way I can describe it. It's fucking weird. Um, no one taught me how to public speak, but I just kind of had to, I had to become a public speaker. I had to do this, had to do that. Never in my wildest dreams, looking back, would I have actually thought it was possible. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a massive advocate of that. And I think, um, I think Ross Edgley as well has a similar mindset where once he uh, gets going on something, he's like, right, you're, you're not running 10K, you're running 20. But, you know, and just doubling things, you can always do more. And, um, yeah, it's one of those things. I think we, we fool ourselves a lot. We're confined by society and by our friends and our family into this safe mindset because ultimately not accomplishing a lot is safe. Not even being fully fulfilled in your life is safe. You know, um, it's one of those things where we're, we're supposed to sit at home, pay taxes, go to work, come home, watch TV and be a good citizen uh, because it's the safe thing to do. And the same way that my friends told me not to be a PT, it was because they wanted to protect me. They didn't want me to end up failing at something. Uh, the same way that probably a lot of people don't run a marathon because they're, they're worried about failing and not completing it. But I do think that we're able to accomplish a lot more than what people think. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the fitness industry simply because I think you're one of the, the only guys with any influence who actually has people's best interest at heart. Um, you mentioned there's no, there's no regulation really in the fitness industry on, on giving bad or good advice. And there's essentially no qualifications needed to promote supplements and, and things like that. So in an age where we're surrounded by endless information and endless, you know, we can, we can go to anyone and get advice pretty much on social media now. How do we sift through that cesspool of information and, and find what's genuine? It's difficult, uh, you know, it's, especially on social media, it's very difficult. Like, uh, everyone should do their due diligence and people do in other areas of life. For instance, when they go on holiday, they check the reviews of things. They look to see what the hotel looks like. What did the last person say? Same when we buy a book. But when it comes to fitness, we're, we're almost basing things off followers, blue ticks, and how someone looks. Um, and sometimes those three things can play out not to be in our favor, which makes things incredibly difficult. I see a, like a bit of an emerging trend of things being evidence-based, which is good, where but I still feel people have got it the wrong way around. They go, James, can you prove that branch chain amino acids are useless? And I'm like, well, shouldn't we be proving their efficacy first? If we're going to buy something, we should be able to prove its efficacy. If we're going to invest in supplements, if we're going to invest in a training plan, can we see how that's going to work? Um, it's... It's a tough one. It's going to be a difficult one to school, but as long as we can kind of just suppress misinformation. Um, and again, like a, a five-star hotel, it often is going to look the part and very rarely is it actually not going to be what you expected. But a lot of these professionals that look fantastic can often still be charlatans, although they look fantastic and they're in good shape. 
Yeah, um, something I picked up on in the book that that really struck a chord with me is when, is when you mentioned fitness expos, and I'm not going to name the name of the fitness expos, but expo I went to when I was 17, um, but it's the biggest one in the UK, let's say. Um, I remember at the time I went there with with all this motivation, and and I met you know I I met people like Steve Cook and and Sean Stafford and. Uh, Christian Guzman and, and people like that and I remember you know coming away from it and, and feeling more disheartened than the motivated and I remember just after I met Steve Cook I I walked out of that space and someone just stuck a can of BCAAs in my hand um, and I remember looking at it thinking is this what I'm missing is this why I don't look like Steve Cook do I need that is this the elixir of life so to speak and um, you, me- you mentioned that a disheartened customer becomes a profitable customer. How weary must we be of, of being made to feel inadequate simply to be sold to? Uh, very, because in other areas of our life, we're immune to it. Like uh, I do coastal walks in Sydney all the time and there are amazing houses. I look at them and I go, fucking hell, that's amazing. And I go, that, that looks great. I love what you've done with the architecture. And sometimes I, I think to myself, I'd love to knock on the fucking door and find out what you do for a living. I'd be like, wait, what do you, what do, you do, mate? Does it pay that well? That's what I want to do. But I leave it. I don't walk past it and come home and go, oh, fuck, I'm in a loft conversion or anything like that. Uh, same with cars. When you see Ferraris or you see supercars, you're like, mate, fucking sweet car. And in our heads, even when we see Ferraris or Lamborghinis, we think, I bet that's a pain in the ass to get in and out of. But when we see these physiques, we don't think, I oh, bet that's a pain in the ass to maintain. We seem to think, and then they give us this facade of how great their life is. Hey, cheap meal. Oh my God, he eats waffles. Um, but you know, ultimately, the same way some people are privileged with their upbringing, some people are privileged with genetics, but we've suddenly become so obsessed with a battle that's no longer internal. It's like a comparison, and I'm, ba- I'm really anti-comparison, where I say it's a thief of joy. Where people are so getting caught up about Oh, how can I look like that? How can I get those traps and delts? I need your workout plan. And suddenly things haven't become self-centric. And I think that's the biggest problem where uh, we, we are comparing. We're standing next to them. I bet if you've got a selfie with Steve Cook afterwards, you'd straight away comparison. His arms, my arms, his abs, my abs, or whatever it is. Um, and I felt very deflated as well when uh, I first went to an expo to see this. And I was like, steroids, 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 steroids. Like, you know, and peak weeks everywhere and all the and it's mostly just bullshit that's there and why couldn't they just have someone in there that's like hey no one's teaching you how to train in there no one's teaching you how to get a good back contraction no one's teaching you mistakes you're making in chest press it's just stringy stringy beaters and uh narcissists and it actually was a big wake-up call to me because i spent two years in Oz and i came back and i'm in this expo and i was like is this my industry is this what is this what i work in um and i haven't really been back to one since no and funny enough when i went to that expo um the main reason i went was because uh, i don't know if you know the mixed martial artist dan hardy um he was there and so I, sp- I spoke to him and i found that from a fitness perspective he was more inspiring to me than than all these guys uh like like steve cook and 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 uh similar guys because you know you look at someone like that you know an mma fighter and you you know they're not on um you know any any gear um and you think that's attainable and you you start to get genuine advice but i think for a lot of uh younger kids especially um and i see a lot of them come come into my gym for example and they, they look up to these guys i'm not i don't think there's enough transparency on performance enhancing drugs and, and, and things like steroids because they feel that might hurt their brand. Um, but how, how big a part do you think steroids are playing in the fitness industry? Do you think that, you know, we look at some guys, they're really likable guys and you think there's no way he could, he could be on, 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 on any of like he's the, he's the most honest, genuine man in the business. Are we being fooled? So I think that you can have the best morals, the best ethos, the best everything, the best attitude. You could be the most chivalrous gentleman in the world. But if your love and your passion and your pursuit is fitness and it's aesthetics and it's bodybuilding and it's physique and it's photo shoots, 
then you are an absolute moron if you don't take performance enhancing drugs because someone else with the same level of aesthetics, charisma, personality is going to overtake you and take your position on the shoot. If you're doing it for a hobby, that's one thing, but if you're doing it for a profession, you've now got pressure on you. And then the same, you know, um, there's, there's one thing that really, um, there's an injectable, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Some guys inject their arms with it. It's a solution that dissolves. Oh, I know. Synthol, synthol. That's it, yeah. So synthol that some people use, it's disgusting. They make their arms massive and it yeah. looks completely out of whack. But actually in the bodybuilding world, synthol is amazing when used correctly because it, they do little touch-ups where one delt might be more pumped than the other or one mm. bicep slightly bigger than the other. And they can't quickly, the guy's got one day out from comp on the morning of it. They use the smallest amount of synthol just to touch them up to the point that people can barely notice. And you can do the same with anabolic steroids. Just a little bit here, just a little bit there. Because some of their steroid use, there's steroid abuse. Now, in our heads, we like to connect the dots straight away. And we go, this is genetics. He's one of the good guys. And there are a few of the good guys because I've pressed a lot of fitness friends. Jamie Alderton, I've literally pressed things the line. I'm like, mate, you must have done some. I got him smashed. I mean smashed. And he was like, mate, I actually color my hair. That's, <laughs> he's like, that's why I'm not natural. I've gone gray when I was young. And Paul Lima as well. I'm like, bro, you must have run a little bit. Nothing. But there are some people as well that when you do press them, they crack. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. And I was like, I thought you were such a good guy. But you're absolutely right. And these people, to run the risk, of potentially your brand missing out, your performance missing out, your physique missing out, to dabble in the background, you'd have to be an idiot to stay clean because no one's going to believe you anyway. No, and I think I'm not totally against it. In you know, in if that's where you, if that's where you are, if you are a bodybuilder, if, if you're competing in those shows, those untested shows, then you know, you do what you got to do. But I feel there needs to be some sort of regulation on transparency because. You know what? I think back when I was younger, and I'm looking at all these guys, and I'm thinking, right, that's attainable. And then after a few years of training, I'm thinking, well, that that's suddenly not attainable anymore. And then and then you start building that into your self esteem, and you think, right, I must be the problem. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, suddenly you're like, oh, I've got inferior genetics. I've got not got yeah. this. I've not got that. Where you never know. They, and again, with perception of it all, you might be able to read for an hour out of a book and you might have the only thing these bodybuilders wish they had because they're struggling with their business model someone's told them to read the four-hour work week but they haven't got the cognitive ability to read a book for an hour not saying mm. the bodybuilder's stupid but we're all suddenly comparing different uh, traits when really they could be struggling with something that's just not visible and then alternatively the intellectuals and the, the intelligent people the ones who can concentrate or write html code suddenly in the fitness world we're basing everything off aesthetics we don't see the struggle that goes on behind the morning workouts the amount of times they're sat in their front room and all their mates are eating sweets they're like i can't uh yeah and we literally just see everything paraded on show and we feel inferior because of it and we think oh it must be the eight week plan that i need yeah i think though that skill of of marketing a business as well when mixed with that can be dangerous i mean i look of um one of the examples, do you know who Mike Chang is? Uh, I don't know Mike Chang. Six-pack shortcuts he, he, he was on YouTube. He was one of the, bi he was one of the biggest guys in, in the fitness industry at one point, and he was just a master marketer. And, you know, everywhere you'd go, but, I, again, that was built in with, you know, su substances and things like that. So I think it just creates a perfect storm of, of you know, not feeling good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, then people... They get disheartened and they buy. And it, it's sad to see because, um, yeah, ultimately they're selling, uh, they're just selling dog shit. Uh, it's not genuine. So, yeah, I, it's one of those things that annoys me. So uh, that's probably why I go after them so much. Yeah, man. I, I think that you know, a sub, the supplement industry, um, especially, uh, you know, we've talked about BCAs, for example, but it's so easy to be in a plateau or something. And you, th and you look online, you go on, you know, my protein or, or, or something like that. And, and you're looking and you're going, right. So I'm not taking creatine. Uh, I'm not taking, maybe it's casein. Maybe that's why I'm not big enough. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That was me. I had the supplement drawer full, mate. Glutamine, carnitine, fuck, uh, everything. Oh, I need a pre-workout. I need more, more weight. I need to do this. Yeah. Um, 
testosterone boosters, I had the lot. Yeah, I, I think it finally clicked for me when I was ordering like green tea extract tablets and things like that. You know? um, Thermobol. Yeah. <laughs> um, as we start to wrap up now, I just got a few questions left that we ask uh, every guest. Um, you've mentioned the four hour work week. Are there any books that you've read throughout your life that have greatly impacted you? Uh, yeah, so a uh, big fan of Ryan Holiday. Um, he's done Ego is the Enemy. Uh, Obstacle is the Way is great for anyone that's going through any emotional hardship. Um, it's very similar to, or it's not that similar. It's out of the same leaf of Mark Manson, Subtle Art, uh, which has been great. Um, I suppose if someone was business minded, maybe to try Four Hour Work Week Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Um, uh, good ones at the moment I've done uh, Outliers which was made me feel more uh, fortunate than, uh, than anything else um, well actually Sapiens but if you're going to read Sapiens audio book it because yeah. it's a dry book but when you listen to it I did Sapiens, Homie Deus in the 21st century and I fall asleep to them and they're incredible I wake up and I'm like guys the South American, the Incas were wiped out by smallpox. Why are we not talking about this? You know, and it's, it's so it's got all these little things that you wake up and you just, yeah, you feel lightened. And it's, I've, I've got this weird passion at the moment for learning things completely outside my curriculum. So Sapiens then got me on to wanting to learn more about space. Um, and then I uh, started doing some Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, books as well. That sounds like a lot of the same sort of books and, um, themes that sort of Joe Rogan explores. Yeah. 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 I, do you know what? I used to hate Joe Rogan's voice. I couldn't <laughs> stand it. Now I listen to the man every night before I go to yeah. bed. And I jokingly said to a friend the other day, in the next few years, if I ever went on his podcast, I'd sit there, I'd be like, Joe, I, I fall asleep to your voice every night, mate. I think it'd be the weirdest dynamic ever. He'd be like, yeah, I had a guest on. I'd be like, yeah, 1442. I remember. It would be quite <laughs> a weird dynamic to have. Yeah, man, I'm the same every night. Um, the next question I have, well, what it would be is, I ask everyone, are there any societal rules or societal norms they love to break? But I'm assuming that's every rule for you, right? Yeah, isolation. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go um, there. <laughs> no, um, so at the moment, uh, societal norms flip the script. Do you know what? Sometimes, I like to have my dessert before my main meal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's probably one of the main ones. And I sit people down and I'm like, guys, there are no rules here. And they're like, oh, but it might ruin it. I'm like, but how? Because usually you're, they're both going to end up in there. We're just flipping the script. Sweet then savory. What could go wrong? And guess what? If you don't like it, we can just go back to normal like nothing ever happened. And I, uh, I guess you can, you can analyze that deeper than just dessert then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there a challenge that you, you can listen to our, um, you can issue to our audience, something they can start implementing in their, in their daily life now that they may not be doing? Maybe it could be, you know, tracking their sleep. Maybe it could be um, something to implement into their, into their fitness, something maybe like yoga, for example. Is there a challenge you can issue? So I reckon people at the moment are in absolute information overloads from their phones, from TV, from media. My advice to people would be, you are to sit for 10 minutes, undistracted, at least once a day, whether it's to come up with a good idea, to solve a problem, whatever it is. And sometimes you sit there, 15, 16, 20 minutes, just be left with your thoughts. Cause I think that's the one thing people are missing. And, if I ever need an idea for a video, I get a pillow on the floor or I sit outside the front of my house without my phone, nothing. I just sit there until a good idea comes. And every time the idea comes and I'm so grateful for putting the 15 minutes aside and doing stuff like that has really benefited me, uh, especially in the last year. If I've got any issues, rather than being, whenever I'm on devices, I'm like ping, 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 like I have so many distractions. Uh, to, for people to just take 10 minutes out not to worry about what's going on in the world, not to worry about unemployment, not to worry about the economy and just have 10 minutes. Great. I've got two more for you. Um, cool. Who are some of your mentors in life? 
maybe they don't have to be people you know, just maybe people you look up to? Um, so uh, one of my main business mentors was a chap called Paul Mort, um, who really helped me kind of, you know, not everyone has to like you, write your fucking emails every day, <laughs> you know, and he ingrained quite a lot of the marketing strategies where I became a lot more ruthless in my marketing. Um, even I remember him saying to me once, the people on your list have either got to buy or die. And he didn't mean they're going to die. But he was like, you've got to start treating your leads that the majority of them are not interested. And the majority of them need to buy, you need to let the others leave. And letting people walk away was massive for me. Understanding that when you understand that if 1% of people buy from your marketing emails, you have a fantastic email campaign. And really set me up for appreciating failure because not everything is going to go 100% right. And um, do you know what? Joe Rogan's probably getting up there or growing on that list, being a black belt in jiu-jitsu, which is what I would love to be one day. Uh, and he is the epitomization of consistency with his podcast. He's not the most listened to in the world because, you know, he's fucking good looking or the funniest guy ever but he turns up every fucking day with a guest and he's a great host and he's never cutting corners or trying to finish them after 15 minutes um and a lot of people connect the dots and oh it's because he hosts ufc or you know anything like that it's not it's because he's turned up every day um and uh yeah so i'd say those two the the last question i have for you is a scenario in which you are okay we can we can say you're on one of your lives then okay and every person on the planet is tuned in and you have enough time to to just impart one message to them one lesson and every person in the world's going to hear it what would you want them to hear i like this question uh no matter what happens to you in life you will be fine you'll be fine no matter what and if you are going to die, we're going to die. So there's no point worrying about it anyway. And the second point to that is the majority of you are eating the wrong way around. The fork belongs in your right hand. Everyone eats. They, they see me in left-handed. I'm like, it's not left-handed. This is the right way. And they go, no, 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 no. The knife should be in your right hand. And I have to say to them, if you're right-handed or the same as the majority of people in the planet, you pick up your food with chopsticks in the right hand, you scoop up soup with the spoon in your right hand, you would pick something up to put it in your mouth, whether it's a bag of sweets or popcorn with your right hand, just because there's a knife on the plate, that shouldn't change. That's some amazing validation for me because I actually <laughs> have this conversation with my girlfriend not so long ago. I always use put the fork in my right hand. So thank you for that one. Mate, you've got a cheesecake, got a Ben and Jerry's, got a uh, chopsticks, you've got a, she goes to put a bag of popcorn, hand in popcorn at the cinema, which you might not be going to for a long time. You're like, oh, right hand is it? How the plot thickens? <laughs> You've got our covered, mate. Exactly, man. Um, where can where can our audience find you and 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 buy the book? Jamesmithacademy.com. Every every road leads to Rome. Emails, website, app, everything from there. Awesome, man. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I've I've really enjoyed it, and I uh, I hope you had a good time as well. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much for having me.